straight up, I love type. Uh, I think typography is what got me into graphic design. It's what keeps me interested in graphic design. And one of my favorite things to do is just to play and throw around black and white typography. Any questions or anything? Comments or backlash? Does anyone need a refund? Like, I need to get out of this school. You should not be trusted with anything. In this video, I'm gonna show a handful of projects from the last 18 years and go into the thinking and the process and, and how I viewed things at those different times and look at the kind of milestones of why did I change my process probably every three years and why am I finally happy with where that process has ended up today? I hope you dig it. If you have any questions or comments, hit me up. What we're gonna do today, I put together a little presentation, a handful of projects with different approaches to using type and they're like how I did it at one point and then like how I did it at another point and kind of how I do it today. One of the reasons that I like to use my own projects is that I know 100% what went into it. Like if, if it was a fuck it kind of decision, I know it was a fuck it decision. So I'm gonna show, I think four different projects. Getting into it, notes on using type. So this first project, this is actually a school project. It was a series of posters for a lecture series here of um, fine artists. And it wasn't a school project. It was a project done while I was in school and it was for the school, but I wasn't doing it for a class or anything like that. A little bit of context. I was one of those people that was like a good student and an absolutely horrible student. So like everyone cut me slack because they knew I had potential, but I was a total garbage student because my head was like so mixed up. The alignment between my process, my beliefs, and my skill set, or something like that, it was totally out of sync. So my entire senior year, I did like a ton of work, but I didn't do any work. It was all this like constant cycle of false starts planning shit out and then never doing it and just constantly being stressed out. And like, you know how I like to tell you, like go for a walk when you have creative block? I just walked my entire senior year. Somehow this is one of the few things I did get done in my senior year. This is the first poster for this series. And in the cursory amount of research I had done, which is like, I had the artist names and probably what the school wrote about them. And it occurs to me now that like one of the reasons you couldn't do research is that most people didn't have websites in 2003. So it was actually like, I'm sitting here being like, why didn't I do more research? And I was like, I couldn't do more research because it's not like these were famous published artists. So all I had to go on was like a handful of slides from the school and whatever Microsoft Word document they had given me. Within that research, the thing that I came up with was that each of the three artists their work dealt with like a, like a core natural element, earth, water, sky, or something like that. I don't remember now. And I think that's probably a stretch to say that, that that's what it was, but it was like a potter, a basket weaver, and something else. And to me, it was like, okay, cool. We got trees, we got dirt or clay, and we got something to do with skies. So one of the first things is like, when I talk about that whole idea of like an insight, which is like a recent idea for me at that moment in time i didn't realize that like oh that's the insight the insight is each of these artists deals with this thing i then immediately jumped into like how do i represent that and made this insanely complicated poster that is essentially an abstract landscape so like at the bottom you've got like this little kind of mountainscape which is to be the ground then you have this half tone photo of trees and then you have these kind of cloud forms that because I'm a maniac and didn't believe in like anything being cool at all. This was like when big bubbly graffiti looking clouds were big. I went outside and like drew actual clouds, which of course like are the least cloud looking things in the world. And then each typeface kind of tied into what that stuff meant. So 
We got like that logger wood type in the background. This is a font called Universe that is essentially like a deconstructed version of Univer. So it looks like it's been photocopied. If you can see the W, which is not here, the W is actually two Vs jammed together. So it was kind of like my joke on like a traditional typeface was like, well, I'll use Universe. And this was like how I did everything. Oh, and there's another big old wood thing because you know, like nature. And this font that says Thursday, March 20th is called uh, something broken hand. And it's like a Elliot Earls font that's a deconstruction of Cheltenham. So like I would not allow myself to use normal fonts by like I would never use Cheltenham or actual universe at this point. Everything had to be like a reference to a, another thing. That was the first poster. Now, on the one hand, I kind of didn't care if anybody got the concept as long as it was sort of interesting looking. But the other thing is it's the worst screen print ever pulled in history because you can see the type looks centered. It's not centered. It's justified. <laughs> so it's a terrible screen print. But so that was the first poster. So then I took those posters down, used a spray paint stencil of more clouds, spray painted over that, and then added this other layer of, layer of type that was supposed to be like a clay kind of reddish color. And there's this really s probably subtle little hierarchy device, which is the red of that type then wraps around the date of his lecture. And then the third one, so her stuff is brown because of tree bark, I think. <laughs> it's hard to remember, it, but there's this other spray painted cloud on it. This is what one of them looked like when I actually made it through all three and was like pretty destroyed. You can see like all the tape edges around it and whatnot. It's got a really nice texture, but it's also kind of an insane mess. I didn't test how screen printing on top of spray paint on top of screen printing was gonna work. The spray paint is pretty dicey. So, and they're very sticky and weird. I have like a love-hate relationship with this thing because on the one hand, when I think about like this idea of just layering up the meaning, but not worrying about if anyone gets it, it's kind of a fascinating idea. Like part of me goes, oh, you could make something really cool this way if it was one potential option. When I talk about stuff like insights and process, the reason it's so important to me is that it was a real struggle to get to this thing. And it was the only idea. It never occurred to me to even have more than one idea, which of course means it's like really stressful when you're dealing with the client because you need them to take the thing that you're making. But then the other thing is that whether we like it or not, it's a fairly involved piece of graphic design. Like it's got these handmade elements. It's literally got like one, two, three, I think it has six fonts within like the system that's developed around it. So there's like a lot of stuff involved in it. And if I could have isolated that insight and been like, okay, it's about elements of nature as a potential insight, then I could have also kind of backtracked a little bit and been like, what are all the ways I could do that? Instead of what are all the ways I could do that? Let's do them all in one poster, like color, form, typeface, blah, blah, blah. And then the one other thing that we never really talked about at this time, but this copy, it's all art school, artist bio gibberish. No one read that and then was like, I'm going to that talk. They probably like had their teachers explain what the talk was about. And then they were like, oh, that sounds cool. Especially if they saw a picture. If I were to do the same thing now, the first thing that I would do besides like obvious actual research is rewrite all the copy so that it was about something that actual human beings can understand and care about and not about a bunch of stuff that's cool, but you don't really go see a lecture because of the theory behind it. You go because there's a hook, something about it that's interesting. Like, oh, whatever. Contemporary artist that uses crafts to do X. Like, that's neat. Not like, this work is the summation of seven years of grad school and blah, 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 blah. And then somewhere in there, you're like, okay, I think it's about baskets. So this is an example of something I actually finished circa 2003. This is a CD package from 2008. At this point, I had worked at Intermedia Arts where I slowly kind of 
No, I kind of kept doing what I was doing at MCAD, but I had to finish things or else I'd get fired. So everything was still too complicated and I did a lot of stuff where I'd make a thing, trace that, scan it in, print it out, just invent all these asinine steps so that I could feel like I was working. And again, I never had like an insight and I never had a real conversation. So it was very conceptual, but at the same time, it was a lot of like self-invented busy work. And one thing I would do is if anyone pissed me off, they got like total three column grid Swiss typography, which then it turned out like I started liking those projects even though I was only doing them for the clients that I hated. So that was weird. But then I went to Target and Target totally unraveled like all of my bullshit. Cause like one, they shouldn't have hired me. And uh, two, when they said concept, they didn't mean concept, like not the way I understood it. So if I started explaining it, the guy would be like, uh, uh too tricky. He would just stop me. And he wanted like a sentence that made sense to actual human beings. And then I was expected to work unbelievably fast, which it turned out I actually liked doing. So at first it was totally anxiety inducing, but then I realized that I hated actually having to spend a lot of time on stuff. So that started applying to my like personal work. Now if things took longer than an hour and a half, I was in a bad mood about how long it was taking instead of my normal thing, which was to procrastinate and then get it done in an hour and a half, but wish that I had 20 more hours. So this was a, um, the totally like personal project. These were recordings of Photoshop files that had been run through an MP3 encoder and needed a little screen printed package for them. And I had finally given myself permission not to give a shit and not to need a reason to do things other than like, it feels right. So all I knew was I wanted to make something that seemed cold and kind of icy. Like I didn't care about if it had a meaning. So I just started laying this thing out, trying to make it look as mechanical as humanly possible. Just all caps, accidents, grotesque, medium, condensed. And then mostly just playing with like surface and really minimal color palettes and exploring layering. These things ended up being like my favorite thing I'd ever made that kind of unlocked this really big thing that, which was that I think I was inventing a lot of conceptual stuff that I was doing as this projection. Cause what I wanted to do was just start in one corner with the type huge and just work my way to the bottom, essentially like a piece of writing that just started up here, got to the bottom, one font, one size, call it a day. Instead of I couldn't imagine ever making those other posters again. It like stressed me out to even think about how they ever came into the like world. Um, whereas this stuff, it was like made one, like, okay, let's make another, like, let's do another thing. And like all of a sudden, um, a lot of my procrastination had disappeared. Uh, and yeah, and very much this idea that like, I no longer needed to be worried about like a concept if I had one great, but if not fine rule lines and accidents, this was a book that we designed in 2010. So at that point I'd been making lots of this bizarro Neo Swiss cold, icy stuff and trying to make things as boring as possible and pretty much started picking fonts based on like whether they felt right and not whether they had like a really good rationale anymore. This book, Past Objects, was a collection of photographs of this guy, Scott Jordan's collection of trash. Basically, he's an amateur archeologist and he digs through construction sites in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or privy wells, which are basically backyard holes in the ground to throw your garbage into. Uh, so if a house was sold and they found one of these, he'd volunteer to dig it up before they actually went and just threw it all in a dump truck. And so they had already shot the photography and they had this unbelievable amount of photography. Like they just sent a hard drive filled with easily a thousand images and they had the size and the page count, which was only 128 pages. So the challenge was both to design it and to basically do the photo editing, which was oddly unfair for the amount of money that it paid. What ended up happening with it was that somewhere we developed this idea, the book would be multiple types of books within it. It would be one part Sotheby's catalog, something that was jammed full of images and one part old archeology span journals. And so it always has these borders because the idea is that every page is a page inside of it. And like when you're looking at this spread that really you're looking at a page from one book on the right and a page from another book on the left. 
I did not completely let go of being overly conceptual and complicated. The actual typography was inspired by Victorian advertising type and um, these old scans of archaeology and like geology journals that we found on Google Books that were like from like 1895. And then that was like what would happen with the typography. This is actually like fairly tasteful for considering how complicated they would get on other pages. That's Scott Jordan digging in a hole. Let's find a good page. So this like the right hand side, this typography was almost a pastiche of these old journals. One of the things that's nice about it is it feels kind of vintagey, but one of the things that's bad about it is the line lengths are brutally long. And it was before I paid attention to such things. I like just typeset stuff based on like, that looks right. Uh, I never did the thing where you sit down and read the book like a book or else I would have noticed like, it feels like this is hard to read. And then I could have asked a smarter person, why do you think this is hard to read? And they would have been like, cause your line lengths are brutally long, but it looks really nice in a photo. And the thing is that that's one of those things where no one's really going to complain about it. Cause like the only people that know it's hard to read cause it's too long are people that know it's hard to read cause it's too long. Everyone else is just gonna like, they're so used to reading shitty stuff all day that it's not like it was the end of the world, but that's like my little bit of pain. So then it goes into these sections of how the book is organized. I think this is like where the kind of typography comes in. These are like gestures to book plates, like classical title pages, except that like our part of us that was concerned with like the Victorian stuff. We try to find fonts that look similar, but then not like look too similar, like basically break the rule of using two geometric sands on the same page. We'd use them like next to each other. So the top is Futura, the bottom is Venus. And then initially every chapter had a different font for the chapter title, but eventually we just went with whatever wood type font that is. It's kind of a close up of like the the typography. So it's like really conservative on the surface, but then it's like kind of purposely breaking a bunch of rules. There's another one. Page of buttons. So the idea with like the Sotheby's catalog, which was like the other concept, was there's photography is beautiful, but we wanted to use as much of it as is humanly possible. So if we did it in a way that didn't look artful, then we could get away with packing the pages full. Whereas if we made it look like a museum catalog, we'd have to be more tasteful about like framing up the images. But if instead it looks like a catalog and you get all the little like figure numbers, then I felt like we could get away with just an obscene amount of images in there. And then this is a detail of what the little caption pages look like, which initially the first versions of these, like this caption would have had like one, two, three, it would have had at least six different fonts. And then, uh, we apologized that like we couldn't finish it. And they were like, we're glad that you can't do six fonts because it was a kind of a nightmare. And then there's more of these little stories. So they get the extra long, brutal line lengths that I feel bad about still. And then this is like another um, longer uh, caption. This was like a very complicated book to do because there's a lot of characters, a lot of um, paragraph and then character styles like that we had to go through and set kind of throughout. And this is a story about how he almost died in essentially a, a garbage wave tsunami. And the one thing I couldn't find images of, but we wanted to fit so many images in that the end papers also have photography with labels on them. And it was stuff that they couldn't, didn't fit the chapters they gave us. So we just, anything we liked, we jammed into the end papers. So this is a poster from 2013. Right after that book for Mark Batty, I had like a total freak out and decided that I was terrible and lazy and that I needed to reinvent everything I was doing as a designer, that it wasn't working. And part of the reason I thought it wasn't working is that I didn't feel like I was coming up with enough concepts. Like that book actually had like five maybe, but I felt like they were variations on a theme. And then the other thing is that I was just doing this kind of quasi Swiss thing all the time. Didn't have an idea, quasi Swiss thing. It was good that I had the confidence to do that, but I felt like it was really bad and lazy. And the big thing that happened was I was teaching professional practice and asking everybody when they were gonna work on their work. 
and what they were going to do first. And like, no one really had an answer. Like one person was like, oh, well, I'm going to do this. And then I work on this class from these times. And everybody else was kind of like really vague and wishy-washy. And someone was like, you know, I can't really be creative on purpose and stuff like that. And I, and I just like had this like moment of, ah, shit, none of these kids have a process. And they're describing my process. Like I could sit down and work at will, but I felt like I couldn't get results as consistently as I'd like. I was falling back on a style too much. So hence bed no diagrams and doing more research than was necessary. So this was one, two, three. I think this was the third project after that kind of moment. RUR was a show at the Soap Factory about artists whose work deals with the presence of like the hand, like you can see that they made the work in some way, and obsolescence, like obsolete technology and stuff like that. The biggest difference between this stuff and how I worked before this was that I always did enough research to have an idea, and then I stopped at that point. Or I didn't even do enough research to have an idea, and then I did my uh, all caps accidents grotesque thing. At this point, I started doing a thing where I would define how much time I had for research, and then I would usually try to do enough to where it felt like I was in overkill territory. Once I felt like I was just reading for fun, I was like, okay, I can probably reel it in now. So in this one, it was a group show. I went to every single artist's website, read as much as I could about them, found interviews with them, jotted down notes about it constantly, and probably worked on the research phase over two weeks while doing other stuff. This was a quote from um, the press release, I think, about the idea of direct work and the creation of the art object. That was an idea I liked. And then ever increasing quantities of the soon to be obsolete, which was like another idea that I really liked and wasn't sure if I was gonna do anything with it. And I may have had a podcast where they talked about the show. The Soap Factory used to make these 10 to 15 minute little podcasts for each show and they would talk to the curator. So I think I had that too. So I had perspective on the show and perspective on the artist. And these are just scans of some of the notes. And this was like before I got a better handle on like what, what you do with research. So at this point, I still didn't know what I was doing with the research. I would just read shit jot notes down and maybe grab a quote here and there. I, I was still kind of in the mode of you do research and you think of solutions to the problem at the same time, which like now I'm 100% off that. But this was the research. And then eventually I started pulling out things that stood out to me via highlighter. In addition, I was doing this other kind of ideation process, which is I would just make lists. So it'd be like 10 ways to do the Soap Factory poster, just kind of like 10 strategies or 10 images. Like if it was just an image, what would they be? And then going through all of that, uh, I had 10 final Soap Factory words, which apparently I quit at eight. So the final keywords for this were, there were concepts and then there were ways of putting together the poster. So the concepts were tracking obsolescence, handmade, ruins, and after image. And then the construction methods were type only, image only, structural typography and industrial typography. Cause those must've been things that jumped out at me while I was doing this research, I think the soap factory itself being a relic of another time and being like an industrial relic kind of made sense. And then this was the bed no diagram. You know, you can either use it as an editing tool, like it gives you an idea and then you can be like, nope, that sucks. Or you can use it in a way where you force the ideas to work. And that was the method that I used. So I barely made a dent in this because for each of these, I made sketches until I was like, okay, that's a cool idea. And then these are the actual, um, design directions. They end up being like extra complicated because of the fact that you have the concepts mashing up against each other and you still have to make, you still have to have ways of putting it together anyway. Uh, this one was like about tracking and obsolescence. I did not use the bed no diagrams to get to iconic, simple ideas. I used them to get as weird as I possibly could. So this one, the idea was I would make a super classic Swiss layout of this thing. Then I would replicate it by hand using Letraset. So I'd like lay it out once, then I'd make a pastiche of that essentially. And then the final poster would be the leftovers of the 
Letra set and a totally different layout on top of it. The, so this idea that like there were ruins behind it and then the type would go on top of it. Just really complicated, but, I, but complicated in a way that I like. This was roughly the same idea, except that I would make it by hand and I would just have ink on my fingers. And so the poster would just be like a totally traditional poster, but it would just be covered with um, ink, which is actually kind of a nice idea too. So I guess I was tracking an obsolescence. This one was based on this idea of an after image. So like, you know, ghost signs and whatnot. Basically the whole poster would be this faded piece of very like, functional typography, but it would be hard to read. And then in the corner, you'd basically have like a museum placard that actually had all the information. So it's essentially like you were looking at a piece of art. This one was about the obsolescence of newspapers and letterpress. So it'd be a drawing of letterpress type. And then there's this classical kind of block at the bottom. And then this one was about tracking and largely an image only solution. So how do you indicate the idea of the hand or the artist's hand in a digital environment? So that was like the big thing as I was trying to do is make posters that interpreted this idea of like tracking what an, a designer does because then the content kind of comes through the poster even if you don't know what it's about. So the idea was to use click tracking software that would map the entire design process. So that's my desktop. That's like running it for 15 minutes to see if it works. And then just layering it with super simple functional typography. That is a Joseph Mueller Brockman. Initially, the plan wasn't to get that close to it. And then there was another insane idea to do that same thing, but then make a watercolor painting of the click tracking so that it would be technology and then obsolescence. I'm so glad that they did not pick that. Oh, and then the type would be done on a typewriter. That would have been a bad idea. And then this one was an alternate which would be instead of layering all the click tracking, the poster would just be this grid of every time the poster had been worked on. And then if we did another piece, that would be a grid that would then have more and more images. So in theory, the title wall would have a lot more images than the poster because the title wall got done later. And then that's the end result. So it, it did change. And one of the things it changed to was essentially like a super traditional museum poster. So one of the ideas that we started playing with was that it was kind of cool if it looked like a piece of art that would be in the show, but then turns out not to be. And then there's no clues as to what it is you're looking at at all. So basically that image is this big, strange visual anchor. And then the type is just this like hyper functionalist, evenly distributed, all one size font. And then these are just a couple of those click tracking maps individual before they were layered on top of each other. I can't remember how many of these there ends up being. And then that's what they look like on the screen printed version when they're all layered up. Oh, and then this is just a close up of the typography. So it's funny because I was trying to get away from doing all this like Swiss stuff, but then like they keep pulling me back in. Uh, and then I'm going to show something more or less brand new. So this is a CD I designed this summer, maybe July. So that's the actual CD. There's actually very little typography on it. The cover has no type whatsoever. It's only on the spine. This project is more akin to what we've been doing in this class, which is slightly different because we started with like mood boards and then would explore those mood boards as buckets. So basically I went back and forth with my mother because that's who this is for with like, here's a bunch of things I was thinking about and they'd be like gradients, type that was disappearing into backgrounds, 70s kind of psychedelic records, library music, Saul LeWitt drawings, whatever. And then she would send back, this is cool, but it seems like really harsh and blah, 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 blah. And so we had like this kind of edit of seven styles. I showed the Josh Harmony thing in the last class when I'm talking about presentation decks. The idea then is to take each of those and play in that bucket. A bunch of studies of gradients, a bunch of drawings about this thing, a bunch of 70s psychedelic studies, a bunch of like abstractions, all of this different stuff and just make stuff for a while and then put it together and see how it fits. So these aren't actually like CD covers. They're just squares exploring the idea of type emerging out of a gradient background. And that's why there's like no color or anything. But in terms of type at this point, unless I have like a really defined concept, which never happens, 
I pretty much just use what I like, what I feel like using. So in here, like I can see some Futura bowl down in the corner. I think that's locator. That's definitely locator. Some universe up in that corner. I tend to just go with whatever I feel like doing because uh, in the grand scheme of things, I might not even keep the font the same by the time I like move this concept forward. If the concept got picked, I might then look at 10 different fonts. So these are more kind of studies with just looking at locator. This whole two spreads was probably done in an hour and a half. And this was just the gradient bucket. And then that type that's kind of right here or in that line ended up in the final on just the spine. So then the interior is actually more of that locator, just kind of as clean and, I don't know, tasteful as possible. But there's definitely not a conceptual reason for it other than like it kind of lets the images do the talking like the images get to be emotional and evocative and the type just gets to be like kind of just the facts without being helvetica or something like that um which is way different than how i was doing work like as a student where like the font always had to mean something even if it was a reference to a reference to a reference and i think part of the reason that this kind of stuff is liberated from concept is from doing these kinds of exercises for a few months and using things that like I would never use and pretty much using fonts based off of, huh, that's cool or that feels right. And using like all the fonts that like you're not supposed to use. So like obviously brush script and like whatever that font that the blacklisted thing is like, um, Hattenschweiler or something, like one of those like system fonts that you like, you never use. Whatever that weird cursive font is right there, or like black letter font, you know, good taste probably determines you don't use it. But I would just like run through the fonts and be like, whoa, what was that? And stop. And I think doing that and doing things I wouldn't allow myself to do before, like repetition. Oh, like this one's got, I don't know, Edwardian script or some shit. Um, but it looks good. I think doing that then makes it much easier when I make work now to not really be so, what does it mean that it's Futura? You know, like if there was like a Design Observer article about like how like using Futura was ridiculous if, if you're not living in like 1958 or whatever, which is like just the most asinine possible thing to say. Because one, it works for lots of stuff. And then two is like, at what point can you use anything then? Like you can't use Garamond, you can't use Kazan, you can't use Helvetica. At that point, you can pretty much only use fonts from like the previous three to five years, which, you know, you already cut yourself off from enough stuff. Cutting yourself off from more stuff seems like a really bad idea. And then the other thing was making stuff with Adobe Spark on my phone where you have no control over the fonts. So then it's like, you can barely figure out how to select the fonts or change them. So being stuck in that then made like my, my standards drop even more, which I like, I think is a good thing. The part that matters to me is the words and what they say. As long as somebody doesn't get the complete and total wrong idea from the treatment. Like I don't want to make a cover for my mother, then have someone look at it and be like, oh, you know what that reminds me of? This one neo-Nazi thing I saw. Like that would be a terrible reaction, right? But like. If someone is like, oh, that seems like this, and they go like, it looks like a fashion thing, and someone else goes, it looks like a pharmaceutical label, and somebody else goes, it looks like blah, 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 blah. That doesn't really bother me, and I think that that's fine. Like, I'm fine with a lot of ambiguity, as long as, to me, in general, it feels right and it looks good. But oddly, like, the way to get to where I thought things looked good was to kind of stop caring so much about how they looked and like, I, I don't think I ever buy fonts. Like I only use new fonts when um, Eric from Process Type Foundry says I have a new font and then he sends it to me and I'm like, oh cool, so do I. Otherwise, like I kind of don't sweat it and it's like using something like Adobe Spark or something ridiculous like iMovie that just completely limits your ability to make creative decisions then becomes very liberating, right? It's kind of like how no one complains in your Instagram story that you don't have more than the three fonts. Eventually you go like, oh, okay, cool. I got three fonts. The challenge is what to do with them, not to wish that they were different. That is kind of a overview of, I don't know, where I've gone over the last 16 or so years.
Hope you enjoyed that, and I hope that you find something in it that is useful to you in some way. This next episode will be all about the themes of speed, parameters, and unusual prompts for making work. Here's a clip. Stretching fonts is like the cardinal sin, right? Like that's like the thing you're not supposed to do. And it's like, you can do it aesthetically anyway, but the other thing is if you're like, I just need to figure out if this idea works, I can't go looking for this ridiculously tall compressed font right now. But what I love about the idea of working general to the specific is you can do all this stuff and, and be very like experimental and very gestural. And then you could come back to it and be like, okay, I like this one. Now I can spend 30 minutes or an hour looking for a font that does this thing organically. Thank <laughs> you.